What do I need to be good at to be great at something? Hello, everyone. You are listening to She Leads with Carly. And in this show, we talk to the absolute best, brightest, and yes, badass leaders. Tap into where your natural curiosity takes you. Just making sure you're not your own roadblock. Even if you do fall, you're going to fall and you're going to learn. Together, let's build a DNA of what it takes to rise to the top and truly make an impact. I'm your host, Carly Malatsky. Hello, everyone. I am excited to welcome our guest today, Jessica Holton. Jessica is the CEO and founder of Ours, a virtual couples therapy and premarital counseling platform with a mission to make couples therapy more accessible, destigmatized, and designed for young modern couples. Beyond Ours, Jessica also founded Access Distributed to help students at non-target recruiting schools land internships in finance. And she also founded Blaze Skincare, a personalized skincare brand. However, Jessica's career started in finance. She received her bachelor's in accounting and finance from Georgetown University, and then started her professional career as an investment banker at Morgan Stanley and the Carlisle Group, before receiving her MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business. Jessica, it is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much, Carly. It is such a pleasure to be here, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. Same, me too. So, Jessica, I want to know. I want to know who were you as a kid? What were what was (laughs) Jessica as a a five year old, ten year old girl like? My mom says that I was very difficult uh, (laughs) because I really hated being bored, and I was always just wanting to go on an adventure or learn something new or do something new. Um, I grew up, uh, my second home was really my, my parents' business that they ran from when I was four years old until I was 14 and it was a children's science museum. So I basically grew up there. So the image that I have in my head growing up was me trying to like be behind the front desk to check in customers and families, um, and me trying to tell my parents what like programs they should run. And I think they put up with me. But that that was like how I grew up was kind of trying to like soak it all up and be at the science museum that my parents were running. And it sounds like a very natural extrovert, right? Talking to people, <laughs> being customer facing. Is that true? No, I'm actually very much an introvert in terms of, you know, where I get my energy from is very much internally and I need my solo recharge time. But I guess if I take the test, I'm borderline extrovert, introvert, and Got it. You know, need, need my energy from my solo time, but also need to kind of see the world and, and be on the go. Yeah, that's such a good description. By the way, I feel very similarly. I'm very aligned with that. And yeah. so growing up as well, did your parents, in their mind, what did they, did they want you to continue with the museum? Like, what were they thinking that you would best be suited for going into college? It's a good question. I think my parents, I think they knew that I would always kind of continue to stay on the go, whether that's mentally or physically, um, and just kind of like try a lot of new things. So when I was going into college, I was really interested in government and I was really interested in business too. So I kind of saw as a graduating high school senior, I wanted to have the most impact that I possibly could on the world. And I liked science, but my sister's actually a doctor. She was always the one who was like, really loved science and the human body. And I knew that I wasn't going to be a doctor. I knew I wasn't going to be a lawyer. Um, And it looks like kind of like this whole range of careers that I could have. And ultimately, the way I saw it was that I could have so much more impact beyond myself and my own physical and just human limitations if I built a business that could have millions of times more impact than just me. And so graduating from high school, that was kind of my, I was interested in government, I was interested in math, but I really felt like business was where I wanted to spend time um, honing skills of. So I think my parents weren't surprised by that. I had like 
so many, I loved working when I was in high school. I had four jobs at any given time and they saw me create all these different calendar businesses and babysitting clubs and all these businesses along the way that I don't think going into business surprised them. That's amazing. And ultimately, like I mentioned, you actually studied finance and we'll get to that. But before that, what was the weirdest job you ever had growing up? The funniest one that I that I was not public about for a very long time was I was a clown. Um, so I would, I would dress up as a clown, Amazing. red nose and all, like face painted clown, the whole dress, the large shoes, the gloves. And I would face paint kids at birthday parties. Um, and I was a friendly clown. I was not a scary clown, <laughs> but I would dress up as clowns and also like Disney characters and, and, fairies and dragons and all these things um, and go to people's houses all throughout New Jersey and do face painting and then like dancing uh, with the kids for birthday parties. So honestly, that was like the best job. It was paid very well. It was all cash and it was fun. I got to see a lot of different parts of New Jersey and helped kids have great birthdays. Um, So yeah, that was That was the most notable one. (laughs) And it's funny because you even mentioned, and this may be a much smaller scale, right? But you mentioned the power of impact and how you were driven by that. And I'm sure like seeing the kids smile and run off with their painted faces, like there's an element there that's really, you know, exciting, compelling. So that's great. Totally. So ultimately you go to Georgetown and you study finance. So tell me a bit about that process. Was that the closest to getting to business or how were you thinking of it in terms of career? Cause you, you then continue down the finance path for, for a little bit. So to be honest, I, I fell in love with Georgetown before I even knew I wanted to go to their, they have an undergrad business school and I fell in love with Georgetown. I loved the idea of being on a small campus in a city and with a long school history and engaged student group. And I got the advice of write, and you have to apply to one of four schools when you apply to Georgetown. And so I got the advice of maximizing chances to get in was to write the essay or choose the school that you can most easily write the essay to. And I just, I felt myself very much more compelled to answer the questions that they asked for the business school. So that's actually why I chose going into the business school. And it's funny how these kind of decisions that we make along the way end up having a very meaningful long-term impact on our life. So as part of being in the business school, we took half of our classes were business school classes and half of them were uh, like liberal arts kind of general requirements classes. And in the business school, I was really gravitated towards, or I gravitated primarily towards kind of more quantitative leaning classes um, in particular, accounting was my favorite class. And I know that sounds weird to some. Unique. Because it's, I'll call it unique. It's unique. <laughs> um, but I just loved, I loved the way it worked. I loved the way it balances. I loved the system that I could learn and then apply to solve problems. Um, so I did that. And then the finance major was really, uh, uh, I saw it as kind of complementing my accounting knowledge and I was an accounting CA, I like to say my favorite extracurricular activity in school. I'm so cool was being a TA for accounting. Um, but yeah, I kind of, it, it was more of, I liked those classes and I wanted to take more of those classes. And that's why I ended up majoring in finance and accounting. Okay. On that note, right. I would love for you, whether it's advice, just insight for students at that stage or even people earlier in their career, right? Because so often we are pretty much influenced by our environment. So like, you know, I studied at Stanford, the most common path is definitely in banking or consulting and you get influenced by that. And you think if I'm not doing this, is it wrong? And so I'd love for you to talk about who helped you most. And I know we talked about the power of mentorship and how did you navigate these decisions and lean on mentors in that process? Yeah, I'll answer that. I will say though, I my biggest regret, if I could end up where I am today, my biggest regret in college was actually studying business. And it's odd because I, I don't think I would be where I am today if I hadn't majored in accounting and finance. But if I could guarantee that I am where I am now, um, I would have 
really just focused on learning as much as possible and doing the things that were interesting to me because I was so focused in undergrad of learning the skills that I would need to be good in business that I would have learned anyway. And I would have learned on the job, but college is this precious time where you get to learn so many things just for the sake of learning and exploring. And I had that but I wish I had maximized that yeah. amount of kind of free exploration. Um, in terms of your question around mentorship and who helped along the way, so many people. I I would point to kind of three groups. One is my peers. Two are the folks kind of a couple years ahead of me. And three are industry professionals. So when it came to peers, I had this group of friends who we were all just trying to figure out what we wanted to do together. And we would spend lunch and dinners talking about what we wanted our careers to look like and our life to look like. And when it came time to recruiting, it really was my peers who we put our little friend group put together these kind of groups of studying for interviews. And we would wake up on Saturday mornings and test each other out and practice questions and really support each other through that process and kind of alert each other of opportunities that we heard about. But the one of the biggest factors was the people who were two years ahead of me, two to three years ahead of me. And I knew them from clubs that I was part of. And I got to watch them go through their own track of figuring out what they wanted to do. And then ultimately go into banking for the most part from where I sat. And they, they helped pull me up through the interview process. They would spend time with me on the phone to talk to me about how to prep for interviews. Um, and they showed me, you know, they were a few steps ahead. So they showed me that this was possible and that this path was a path that I could follow and see myself be a part of. And then third is certainly the industry professionals. So it started with uh, one woman in particular at Morgan Stanley, who was also a Georgetown alum, she sat next to me during the interview process, after the interview process, and she just believed in me and um, took that 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 belief in me helped me see a path forward and have some more confidence in myself. And I got to see what being an adult in the finance world would ultimately look like. She has kids, she has a family, she's seen a lot and done a lot. And so she and a lot of other people at Morgan Stanley, I'm still very close with, um, kind of showed me the ropes and have supported me throughout. And I think it's so important to have that like long lasting support where they've seen me through banking and investing and business school and entrepreneurship and we now have a really close relationship that has spanned several years, if not over a decade, that I think is really important. It's amazing. And it reminds me, on Chile, someone mentioned that they always had someone who's two years ahead of them, yeah. five years, and 10. And just like yeah. keeping track in those milestones almost of like, this is where I want to be, or at least I think I want to be, and then yeah. almost backtracking it. So I think that's such a it's such a great way. And Ultimately, so once you were at Morgan Stanley, I'm so curious because now, and obviously we'll get into it, it's very different, you know, than than finance world. And when when that mentor of yours was talking and you were seeing who she was and what it means to be a leader in finance as a woman, were you excited by that? Were you feeling fulfilled at that moment? Or were you like the opposite? Like I I I will start my own company one day and be away from finance. I think both. I was really excited about doing something that felt really hard and seeing if I could succeed in it. To me, those kids who were two to three years ahead of me, they were ridiculously smart and ambitious and people who I really, really looked up to. And I wanted to see if I could follow in their footsteps and also succeed in this thing that is just like notorious for being grueling and hard and you know, in, in particular for women who it's, it's still today a very male dominated world. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. Um, so I was very much up for the challenge. And in hindsight, it also gave me this amazing foundation just to understand business fundamentally through and see so many different transactions and industries that I never would have seen otherwise. So I was excited 
but even going into banking and investing, I always knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to start something. I never knew what, but when I looked into my future 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from then, it was very much a given. It was more a matter of when, not if, that I would start something. And that to me was the ultimate dream. I just didn't know what I would want to start. I definitely didn't have the confidence or kind of like risk tolerance at that point to start something. And I, yeah. I never would have known how to start. I, I give so much kudos to people who start a, a company right after college or dropping out from college because I never could have done that. But yeah, it, it was both. It was like excited for the challenge and also, you know, knowing that it probably wouldn't be my forever yeah. Thanks. So I can go in a couple different directions here, but I want to even, you mentioned something where you felt you needed to prove to yourself. And I think mm-hmm. this is a common motivation, if you will, that a lot of women have. And I'm curious during your time in finance, did you ever have a moment where, you know, the male dominated space, they doubted you or a comment was made or you weren't able to get promoted and so, and your male counterpart was like, did you ever have that situation where you felt it personally? Uh, my group at Morgan Stanley was so phenomenal. And so was my group at Carlisle. And part of it is a little bit self-selecting in that I really wanted to go into my group at MS and chose, I loved my group at Carlisle from the time that I was interviewing. And at Carlisle, it was actually a half women were in the group. So it was actually half and half. Um, That's great. And my MS group was just so fantastically supportive of women. So I didn't feel that, fortunately, from a career perspective, where I felt that more was actually more of like the social um, kind of dynamics throughout. So for example, like the classic, you know, the guys would be talking about sports. And, you know, during our Monday morning meetings, then we would kick off by talking about sports and I, I never have been, and I never will be a sports enthusiast, uh, in the way that like to speak that language, to be able to bond with my male managers and peers. Um, and same thing with like going out to lunch. Like I ended up going out to lunch primarily with the woman who sat next to me, who is still one of my closest and dearest friends from finance. Yeah. And I felt it more in the, in that kind of like social, like, do I belong here? It was much more of an, I think, internal thing, actually, that I felt like I didn't belong. And whether that was coming from external or internal sources, it was very much felt. Um, But I kind of ended up harnessing it for feeling like Mm. it drove that competition in me that I I wanted to prove it to myself first, that I did belong there. Um, And then the kind of like the external pressure is just kind of felt like I felt like if I believed in, in hindsight, if I believed in myself, then it didn't really matter what other, like I, then the results would hopefully speak for themselves. Yeah, totally. I love that. I I love the mindset. It's very clear that you kind of exuded that, which is great. So what went into the decision to go to business school? And it's something that I'm, you know, thinking about, and I know my counterparts and peers are as well. And I would love to know what went into it. But then even beyond that, do you think it's helped you as a founder today? The answer to your second question is absolutely. And I'll wow. share why. Yeah. But what went into it is, again, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a little embarrassed to say, it, but it was not a like, super intentional decision it kind of came about and in talking to a lot of people. So going back to your question on mentorship, what I have found is it's very kind of interesting to note that all the people in my life, I kind of think about their paths as uh, paths that I look up to in some way or another. I have one person who, one very close friend of mine who uh, moved abroad and is now someone who I really look for career, but also life advice from. I have a friend who started a finance company and investing firm, and I have looked up to him in so many ways. And who I go to for advice is kind of like, uh, I, I have found that I go to the people for advice for when I want to be guided in their direction. Oh. Um, and so I, I was in this moment of, I knew I didn't want to stay in investing forever. I found that it just was not the thing that got me up in the morning and excited every single day. And I actually found myself 
jealous and envious of the management teams across the table from me who I would talk to. They were out building things. They were talking to customers. They were building brands. They were developing marketing plans the same day that they were developing formulas for skincare. And I felt really jealous of that. So I just, I knew in my heart that investing was not going to be for me long-term. But I would talk to all of these people and I, I did primarily talk to people who had gone to business school and not one of them regretted going to business school. And to be honest, Carly, that's the number one reason why I applied was no one has regretted it. Everyone yeah. has said they would do it again. So I want to do something I'm not going to regret. And that it was like kind of as simple as that. Um, and I looked at it as... At that point, I still didn't feel like I had the skills or foundation or safety to just go out and build something on my own. I had no idea what that would look like. And so to me, it felt like, let me take these two years of time to carve out of my life to design what I wanted the rest of my life, not only my career, but the rest of my life to look like and meet new people who are outside of the finance world. Um, take time to travel and really be intentional about who I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. And it ended up being exactly that um, and so much more. So I, I too don't regret it. And that is what ultimately drove me to apply in the first place. And it's funny because actually applying may may seem, you know, up in the air, at least like you don't want to regret it. But for me, as you were describing it, the word intentionality, that yeah. really screams out of it. Like you, you knew you were taking these two years to put yourself first and almost outline what the next X amount yeah. of years look like. So I think there is that intentionality. And then given your experience, what are the elements that allowed you to really optimize that in those two years? What did you do tangible, you know, items that made it the best two years that you don't regret? I think being intentional about what I wanted to get out of it was really important because in business school, and if you're thinking about going to business school, it's the most chaotic, beautiful pause and a hundred mile an hour journey that I could imagine taking. I knew going into business school that I wanted to focus on diving into entrepreneurship and setting myself up to build a business afterwards. And what that meant was... I, I, that helps influence what classes I took, who I surrounded myself by, what clubs I engaged with, what trips I went on. And just having that kind of focus mentally and emotionally around what I wanted to get out of this really helped guide from the get-go. Yeah. Um, and I think we talked a lot in my class around, about priorities and everyone kind of always in the back of their minds had their number one, two, and three priorities. And I think that really helps because it really helps focus your time. And I mean, you know, at Stanford, there's so many things to take advantage of and um, it would be impossible to do it all. And so having one goal and one, you know, where's 80% of my energy and mental focus going was really helpful in being able to make the most of it. Do you remember what your one, two, and three priorities were at the time? I Number one was definitely being in startup world. And okay. I, I just wanted to immerse, I wanted to equip myself with the confidence to start something after, after uh, business school. So that was number one. Number two was people. I really wanted to uh, build friendships and relationships with people who I never would have met before. Going into business school, I actually didn't have any kind of filter on that, but I ended up being so grateful for, in particular, my female friendships from business school, which are so special uh, to me. And then third was exploration. So I wanted to see the world and I wanted to see a lot of things and learn things that I never would have otherwise learned. So I ended up taking a few comp sci classes at Stanford and I loved those classes. I went on so many trips around the world that I just loved seeing new places and just being in new places. Um, so that was definitely number three. And then I'd probably say number four was like kind of like a personal health journey, which was ultimately what sparked ours and building relationship health. 
but, uh, you know, kind of getting in touch with hiking and eating well and yoga and meditation was definitely something yeah. that ended up kind of being a side effect of being yeah. at, in the Bay Area. And it's amazing because it sounds like what you almost yearned for during undergrad to explore yes. and, you know, follow your passions in academic subjects, even you were able to do at business school and take comp sci and all these other classes, which is great. Yeah, and definitely. So before we get to ours, which I'm so excited to just dive into it, I want to know about Access Distributed. Tell me a little bit yeah. about that, where it is today, and what what prompted you to say this is this is a gap and we need to fill it. Oh my gosh! So one of so in banking right after college, and actually during my internship, uh, one of my peers, his name is Manny, and he sat right behind me for two and a half years. We were back to back with each other, and we went through it all together. We went through, you know, graduating from college and entering the finance world. His family didn't come from a finance background and neither did mine. And we kind of, at the time we were a little competitive with each other, but in a healthy way. And um, we got to know each other really well. We became really good friends. We ultimately both ended up going into investing and then we re-met at Stanford and we were in the same class for business school. And afterwards, he was uh, starting or operating a tech company, and I was starting a skincare company. And we were just on the phone. We've been each other's sounding boards now for over 10 years. And we were on the phone, and we were reflecting about how much we feel like we can do anything that we want to do in terms of a career, all because we started in finance. And starting a career in finance he ended up actually starting an investing firm. So he's still in the finance world, but regardless of where students want to go, I always say starting in finance will never do you wrong. And we were reflecting on just how lucky we were to kind of like land by accident in the finance world. And in particular in banking and then in investing. And it gave us the financial security. It gave us skills. It gave us a network. It taught us an insane amount about business and we, we had found ourselves at that point being on the phone with a lot of students, undergrads, who were trying to break into finance. And we, and this kind of goes back to like, I could help impact those students who maybe reached out to me because of the Georgetown network or because they have friends who, I, you know, said, reach out to Jessica. Um, but I could only impact those individuals who I would have a 30 minute or 45 minute call with. And the same thing was happening for Manny. He was helping all these students who would do calls with him. And it just, it dawned on us that if we create a program that does basically that, what we're doing in calls and helps train students so that they feel confident going into interviews and we help them get interviews, then we could open the doors just like doors were open for us for hundreds, thousands of people in a way that we would never be able to do if it were just down to our physical time that we have in the day, helping people out on phone calls. So we decided that I remember exactly where I was. I was in my Williamsburg apartment when I was on the phone with him. It was a year before the pandemic. And we decided to build this program that would help train sophomores in undergrads, um, undergrad sophomores to, uh, become really well equipped in finance and accounting skills and then help them through the interview process. And so we just finished our fifth year of that program and it's grown quite a bit. We've had lots of partners and um, it's something that we we're really proud of for the impact that it had or has had not only on the fellows, the students who go through it, but also with the finance firms that we partner with and Our partners are absolutely incredible. They support our mission. They support our students. They interview our students. Um, And we think that we're really, you know, our mission is to change the face of finance and make it totally normal for a woman or a black man or anyone, a first generation college student to be in the incoming class at a bank or at a private equity firm. So it's been an exciting ride in a lot of ways. It feels like we're just getting started and something that 
I feel really passionate about opening those doors for and feel really lucky to be able to do this. Yeah, no, it's, in, it's absolutely incredible. And it seems very mission driven more than anything, right? It's like having Definitely. that true impact, which Definitely. is great. And so Jessica, after, you know, a few years, the concept of ours came up and I would love to know, talk me through that process and even more so what gave you that confidence of saying, oh, this is, this is it. Like I'm, I'm ready to take that leap. I was going through this health journey of my own and I was, I have eczema. I was learning what influences my skin and, and bothers my skin and all of these things. I was going on this yoga, eating right, meditation journey of mine for a couple of years and therapy was part of that as well. And at the time I had been with my now husband for about five years and we met the very first day of college. And as he likes to say, immediately started dating seven years later. Um, <laughs> we, we were friends for a while and we've known each other for a really long time, almost half of our lives. But when it started becoming serious, we, I said to him, I really want to go to couples therapy. I want to have the same impact that individual therapy and all of these health related health and wellness related activities of mine have had on me personally. I want that same impact for us. And I want us to last. I've seen what it looks like when relationships don't work and communication breaks down. I've seen tons of people who wish they had gone to couples counseling early, earlier. So I said to him, can we go to couples therapy? And he was immediately down. He was very much like, Absolutely. I'm definitely in wow. supportive of this. Um, let's do it. And so we started talking to friends, asking for recommendations on who to work with. And a lot of friends would say, what did he do to you? What did you do to him? I didn't know you were going to break up. And we were like, no, it's actually the opposite. It's This is so important to us that we want to invest in our relationship and make it even stronger and something that we don't think is a passive, a relationship works or doesn't work. We always have to put time and energy into it. And we want to, to expand the way that we care for our relationship. Um, and then we would reach out to therapists and it was so difficult to get on the phone with or email with therapists. And I think I reached out to about 20 different therapists and heard back from maybe half of them. And I got voicemails. And if you know me, I keep my voicemail box full because I don't like voicemails. And it was just a really hard, hard journey to get started in. And it felt so stigmatized. Mm -hmm. Even therapists who we would come into the first session with or a chemistry call with would say, what's the problem? What are you looking to solve? And I, I fully recognize that so many couples are going to couples therapy with a particular challenge, but that feeling of we didn't belong in this room because we didn't have, I mean, our relationship was and never will be perfect. I said that in my vows to him during our wedding, but it wasn't like we were solving a particular challenge that needed to be solved. And it made us feel like ashamed and like guilty or that we didn't belong and that was the fire that was for me. I was like, if we feel like this and we have a healthy, loving relationship, then how do the millions of couples feel when they are facing something that is challenging or they also just want to get better in their relationship and care for their relationship intentionally? And so I started to dream of a world where we go to couples therapy right after we do yoga on Sunday mornings and in between yoga and brunch. And what would this world feel like and be like and look like if we all had kinder, more loving relationships. And so that kind of kicked off this journey to learning about therapy as a, from a business perspective and getting to know thousands of therapists, thousands of couples and ultimately build ours with my co-founder. Yeah. Like you said, therapy in general, right, is still has stigma, but that already, like we're going in a, in a great direction where it is becoming destigmatized. And then you add couples therapy, it's even, it's even a higher layer. And so for me, you know, hearing about your friend's reaction, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had a very similar experience to you. My previous relationship, we also did couples therapy as a proactive 
mechanism, mm-hmm. if you will. But I think the difference between between us is I didn't feel the need to share with anyone or I didn't want to share with <laughs> anyone because of that, you know, common perception of it all. And so I think that's so interesting. And I, I love that you shared that story because I think it just adds a whole different dimension to it all. But I, I want you to even go deeper of what is the power of going to couples therapy? Because you even said the therapist may also be the one saying, what is your problem? Why are you coming here? So in that sense, what do you talk about, right? Like what is the power and the benefit of going to couples therapy? And has there been that teaching element in building ours? So ours, we, I met my co-founder about four years ago and we started really, actually tomorrow is our four year anniversary of incorporating ours. And it's gone through many different iterations of product, and the earlier iterations were very much focused primarily on education and on skill building and conversations. And about a year ago, we pivoted into couples therapy and being able to offer and match couples with therapists. So to answer your question, I would say it comes down to two things, um, at least at ours. One is the therapists who are on our platform. We, we know every single one of them. We interview them and onboard them and choose to work with therapists who believe in the power of proactive counseling with couples. And we have couples who are both proactive and reactive. And, and our therapists know which kind of general loose category that couple fits into before seeing them. So a lot of it does come down to the relationship that couples have with their therapist and knowing from the get go that, you know, we want you to do an audit or assessment about our relationship and tell us where we should work on, or we're going to come to you and tell you what challenge we're going through and hope that you'll help us figure that out too. So one is the therapist. Um, two at ours, we have a lot of tools that couples can use before, in between, and after sessions, such as conversation card decks. So if you're a couple who is engaged and getting married soon, a lot of couples are doing premarital counseling on ours. And in addition to live sessions, those couples are, they get access to what we call deep dives and card decks. And so they're having these conversations that are self-guided and kind of get integrated into their therapeutic experience around our families of origin or sex and intimacy, roles and responsibilities around the house, how we're going to split our finances. And so I think that being part of the platform at, on ours by default is going to match couples with mm-hmm. the right therapist and also provide them with tools to have that kind of proactive intentional care for their relationship that doesn't necessarily exist when you're simply going to a therapist who is accustomed to really helping you through a specific challenge. Right. Oh, that's awesome. You mentioned your co-founder and I actually talk about this a lot with the founders that come on this podcast, which is choosing a co-founder. And for you, I remember when we first talked, you There was nothing negative in a way. It was almost like the special, (laughs) special relationship, which is so powerful. And I'd love for you to talk about that. And where do you think most co-founders at least go wrong? Where is that mishap that they make? Oh, man. So I met my co-founder in April of 2020. So it was the very beginning of the pandemic. And he was in Houston. I was in New York. And we met on a phone call. A friend of a friend of a friend connected us. Wow. And we did a phone call uh, in April of 2020, which would be the first of thousands of hours that we've spent on the phone. And it took us a year and a half to meet in person because of the pandemic. And we were living so far away. And we actually, when we first connected, we were both working on something in the relationship space. Um, And we connected just to meet other founders in the space, not to evaluate being each other's co-founders. But by the end of our first hour long conversation, we were, it was, we both came away from that feeling like this is creepy. You are saying the exact same thing about relationships and relationship health and startups that I am. 
to the point where we exchanged, we had like kind of vision documents that we ended up exchanging with each other that was remarkably similar. Um, and so it took only a couple of weeks for us to say, hey, we could be much bigger, better if we join forces. And we had a lot of conversations because to your point, we knew that the biggest risk in startups is the co-founder relationship. So we did we did this kind of like list of, I want to say like 40 questions for co-founders to ask each other. Mm-hmm. And we prepared them beforehand. And then we talked through every single one. And we spent a lot of upfront time understanding each other and not only how we would build this business and figure out who does what, but really understanding each other and what motivates us and what our values are, where we see this business heading, where it's going to fit into our life, what outside of business is important to us in our lives. Um, And we kind of have always kind of kept returning to those conversations because in the last four years, those, those have changed. Of course, our values haven't, but how we envision the future and where we want this business to play a role in our lives has, has shifted. Um, and I think, I think the two things that we've gotten right, or maybe three things that we've gotten right are at the end of the day, we're always kind to each other. Um, we, I can remember one fight where we were, or argument that we had that we were not proud of the way we were speaking to each other. And my co-founder was like, let's just call it like, let's hang up the phone and revisit this. We're not our best selves right now. Um, and besides that, like, we're just, we're always kind to each other and we assume best intention. Um, number two is communication. We made it a point very early on to say, if there's anything at all that is bothering you, tell me, even if it's like how you breathe on a phone call, like literally anything that is bothersome, tell me about it. And we have this kind of understanding that like, I might not do anything about it, but at least by knowing what bothers, and it's not always like the little things, it's like the big things too, of like, you know, decisions or things that things that could build into resentments, we want to know about it and surface it and talk about it before it becomes a bigger thing that we would not be able to get across. Um, and then third is trust. Um, I trust him and I would hope that he trusts me to make decisions that we would ourselves make um, and having that trust that we're aligned, rowing the same direction on the same team, no matter what, that it's that, you know, we can be extensions of each other and really truly be co-founders building this together. And I think, I think where other co-founding teams go wrong is when, um, Sometimes I think when people want something different out of the business or they have different dreams or ambitions for where they're taking the business, um, certainly different values. And then at the end of the day, like those three things that I think we've gotten really lucky of getting right, like communication, kindness, and trust. I mean, it's true of any relationship and a co-founding relationship just exacerbates any differences, I think, um, when you're building something in such a high pressure environment. But yeah. I, I feel like the luckiest person in the world to have known my co-founder. And I don't think we really, we set our relationship up to be very open and communicative. But I think we also just got really, really lucky that we were connected when we were and how we were. And um, there's not much you can do to like replicate that. And it seems like you took the steps before jumping ship, right? You took the steps to say like, let's do the 40 questions, you know, as trivial or whatever they may be. It's still, there's again, that intentionality, which is awesome. Another element that I would love for you to talk about is fundraising. And there was also this, this, you chose to say like, I will lead it rather than my male co-founder. So talk me through that process and how that experience was for you. So there was, there was kind of this one moment where we were looking at the numbers and we were reflecting on, at some point we were doing the fundraising together. And then we realized there's kind of learnings and conversations that can compound if just one of us takes this on. 
And for a while, we were co-CEOs. So we were making the decision of who's going to lead this. And in my head, and this goes back to how I was feeling in banking, being a woman in a male-dominated space. In my head, I was like, I want to do whatever's best for the company. And um, putting ego aside, what will result in the best outcome for this business? Um, And part of me was like, well, looking at the numbers, like, Male founders get more money. Male founders are more successful at fundraising and investors back male founders multiple times more than female founders. And I had this moment of saying, well, if that's true, then shouldn't he lead fundraising so that we are more successful um, if, if the statistics hold true? And so there was that kind of realization that I was like, it doesn't matter how wrong I think that is and how much I want to change that about the startup world and fundraising world. If that's the case, like how do we think about setting this business up for success? And what it came down to was we, we kind of did this map of who likes these conversations and who is, um, you know, already in conversations with some investors and I, I really, really love fundraising. And I think it's, it's kind of one of those things that you either love or you don't like at all. Yeah. Um, and I really love fundraising. I love living in this world of the future and painting that picture and getting people to believe in this vision that we have as a team. And so we ultimately decided that I would lead fundraising. And um, it's been we've raised a couple of rounds. Um, and I would say, although I lead fundraising, he and I are very much part of the fundraising efforts together. Um, and so it's not like I'm going off on fundraising and he's not at all a part of it. Uh, but yeah, it's been definitely a lot of learning and a skill that I think is critical to learn. And is also something that I think we can all always get better and better at over time. I would garner that your excitement for fundraising and even talking about the future that you're building really translates over when you're speaking to investors. And so I wonder, do you, do you have advice for other, whether it's female founders, founders in general going to raise, I almost wonder if they should even, you know, convince themselves that that they're excited about fundraising. Because I think the opposite sentiment is more common, you know, which makes sense as well. Like, I just want to build. I don't care about fundraising. I just need the money to build. And there's that messaging. So how do you play those two? And what advice do you have? I really think you hit the nail on the head. I think, I think convincing yourself that this is exciting is really important because we're all human beings. We can all read the room when someone's not into being in the room. And uh, that, that plays off. Right. And the more and more you can be a real person who is excited, excitement around what you're building and sharing that with other people is, is what fundraising is. Um, And so my advice, I would say two things. One is very dreamy and one is very tactical. Um, Dreamy wise, be excited about what you're building and share that excitement approach fundraising as actually an incredible opportunity to to take up the airtime of someone who is very smart and experienced and has seen a lot and share with them what you're building share with them the most important thing in your life potentially and i think that's a really unique opportunity how many of us get to talk with hundreds of really smart people and get their feedback immediately on our business and share what we're building this like very special thing that my team and I have created and will create. I get to share that with an investor. Like that's the cool, like what an amazing opportunity um, to be able to get that. And I, I think like that kind of excitement and and enthusiasm and sharing helps you just be authentically and genuinely yourself. And you wouldn't be building the business that you're building if you weren't, excited about it. And being in the startup world is too hard to, to just do something for the sake of doing it or to see it as a job. And so I think having that excitement is helpful. 
No. The second thing tactically um, is just know you're going to have a hundred conversations or more and be like mentally prepared for 99 no's and it takes one yes. Um, and what I like to do is I have um, a tracker of a target list of funds and individuals and be really, really organized about every single conversation that you have. And to the extent that you can take notes and get immediate feedback right after, even if it's not feedback from the investor, you can tell like when someone is excited about something or when they're concerned about something by what they're asking and how they're engaging with you. And so after every single conversation, take note of that and tweak that for the next one or learn from that. And if you hear the same thing over and over again, like, you know, have a plan for what those concerns are going to be and how you'll mitigate them because investors have seen so many more companies than we as operators will ever see on our own. Um, so being really like organized and systematized about that while maintaining enthusiasm. No, I it's, love that. I will it's, say it's all easier said than done and easier for me to be excited about fundraising on the other side of it. When you're in it, it, it definitely feels like, okay, we've had 25 conversations. They've all said, no, is 26 really going to be that different? You know, it, it's, it's a grueling process. I will, yeah. I will not hide that. Taking a bird's eye view of your entire journey and especially what you're building now, what have you learned about yourself, particularly in this crazy world of entrepreneurship with ours? I've tried to make decisions too intentionally sometimes. And I think that when I look at the decisions that we've made as a business, the best decisions that we've made actually didn't really have that much rationale behind it. It, I have learned, and this is something that I'm very much still working on. I'm not saying that I'm remarkable at this yet. Um, But the the fact that we've been in this space for as long as we've had as we have and we've talked to probably tens of thousands of therapists and couples at this point that we have intuition and trusting that intuition and making decisions to move faster can be better than making decisions based on tons and tons and tons of experiments and data um and so i've learned that i often will do better for like a better business outcome might come when I make a decision and just trust that decision um, rather than trying to like validate it um, over and over again. And then the second thing is I really love seeing the impact of what we build. I love, I love building something that matters and um, seeing people's lives change as a result of what we're building. Um, And I love building with people that I like uh, so I, it's probably not a surprise given that I always wanted to build something, but it definitely has reinforced like this is where I am in my most flow. And I, I'm so appreciative of the power of intuition that you mentioned that because even I think some people, you know, you grow up career driven, whatever it may be, there's a lot of that intentionality in it. And we've talked about it throughout this, this episode, but I do think even when I think of myself, a lot of the best things that have come up have been things that I'm like, F it, let's do it. Or, you know, like I don't even think about it. And I just send, send that email or have a cold message or whatever it may be. So I think there's, there's that balance perhaps, but I think it's so powerful. I love that. Definitely. Okay. My last question for you is, so I think the intuition part is almost, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the craft that you're spending your lifetime honing or what would that be for you? I I think I'm spending my lifetime honing, building something that matters kindly. Um, mm. And what I mean by that is building something that changes people's lives and knowing how to really get to the heart of the matter of what will solve people's problems. Knowing how to build that with a team that um, like I can't do it myself and knowing who the right people are and skill sets and ways of thinking are to be a part of that. And kindly, um, you know, staying true to myself and 
being genuine and authentic and trying to do the right thing as much as I possibly can and be able to look back and be proud of how we built it. It's just as important, if not more important on what we build and where it goes. Um, so yeah, building something that matters kind of. Yeah. That's amazing. Jessica, it has been such a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so, so much for joining me. Thank you, Carly. This is so fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the show this week. If you enjoyed, please spread the word. Tell someone about She Leads or post about it on social media and tag us. If you want to contact us, feel free to send over a message through the She Leads Instagram page at sheleads.show. If you want to follow us on Twitter, our account is at sheleadsshow. And mine is at Carly Malatsky. This episode was produced and edited by Nick Fershow. Thank you also to our partner, Floodgate. If you're passionate about startups and want to learn more about the starting journey of those who have built groundbreaking companies, I highly recommend listening to Starting Greatness with Mike Maples Jr., the founding partner of Floodgate. He has an incredible show that, in my opinion, is definitely worth your time. Thanks again.